Coming up on this episode of Off The Fence, we look at what we should be taking away from Willie Mullins' stable tour. We also look back at the action in Ireland and England. We look ahead to the Gold Cup and the Stairs Hurdle and there's tracker time as well and Tony takes offence to something. So there is plenty coming up on this episode of the show but also I have some very exciting news for all of you Off The Fence viewers. We can now finally announce that we will be doing an Off The Fence Live for four nights during the Cheltenham Festival, Monday through to Thursday. It'll be live on all the At The Races digital platforms, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. You'll head over there and we'll preview and review all the racing action with Tony and Barry as the week progresses throughout the Cheltenham Festival. I cannot wait and I hope that you will all be tuning in as well. But without further ado, let's crack straight on with the show. Hello and welcome to Off The Fence. This is your weekly rundown of all things jump racing. You know the drill by now. Hit subscribe on our YouTube channel so you don't miss a single episode. Uh, every week I'm joined by Barry Garrity and Tony Keenan. Quick check in with them. Uh, Tony, how have you been the last seven days? Yeah, all good, all quiet. Um, wasn't working this weekend, there's no tips on the website, but I had a couple of absolute sickness at Ferry House. I managed to back man to work in the first race. I thought he was coming to give the car then a bit of a race and I backed the Scary at 10. So, um, feeling great for him on Saturday evening after that so there you go. Okay okay well glad to hear that you've recovered from Monday night call anyway you sound in cheerier form. Uh, Barry how are you how was your week? Good had a nice easy week uh, Vanessa was lucky enough to go to Portugal for a few days and so caught a bit of sun and a bit of rest and was keeping an eye on the racing from afar. Oh I actually was in holidays too but unfortunately <laughs> I, did, I only went as far as, as Newry so uh, yeah you, you got me there Barry anyway so fair play to you. <laughs> Nice, nice. So I'm glad you've all got a bit of rest ahead of Cheltenham. A uh, busy couple of weeks coming up now. And of course, it's been a busy week in the yards up and down the country in Ireland and in the UK because stable tours left, right and centre. Stables are opening up their yards for the press. Usual thing, the gravy train and one of the big ones was Willie Mullins' press day uh, back in the middle of last week. And Tony, there was a few things that sort of caught your attention, I think, that might have gone under the radar a touch. Well, the first one hasn't gone under the radar at all, anything but, but it's just the idea that uh, the acceptance to gallop in the Champs is going for the shorter race. Uh, the, the turners, um, well, the exchange markets would certainly suggest that uh, that's the way it's going. I, I wouldn't be absolutely certain. I think it's actually a plus for both races um, that he goes that way. I think you have a, a brilliant setup between himself and Bob Allinger and Lom Press, and I'd say the. Um, the Broadway or the Brown Advisory is going to be a very competitive, interesting race now um, without them rather than having two really skinny ones. But I suppose the things that stood out to me reading the stable tour were a few negatives, um, five or six things that I thought that were quite interesting here. Um, first of all, I suppose the negativity around Alboom photo and his homework, he just doesn't seem to be that happy with him. And I suppose the knock on effect of that is that he seems to be happy enough to run uh, Tornado Flyer and, and probably a staring for Lange in the Gold Cup as well as backups. So a slight possibility they could have gone the right in there. We'll see about that. Um, Capadano's a horse I would have a lot of time for this, but this fall that he had at the Dublin Racing Festival seems to have affected him a little bit. He hurt his shoulder. You know, he's back riding out a bit. I, I'd say a tight enough time window. I'm sure he run at Cheltenham, but I wonder what he needed a small bit. Um, Concertista was another one where there's a little bit of negativity um, that she did a small setback a few weeks ago um, hadn't had any entries I, I think since Christmas I think there would have been even be precautionary ones uh, at the Dublin Racing Festival so that's quite interesting she's going to the Mayor's Chase uh, well she is thin on experience relative to the other two fancied runners so we'll see how that plays out um, I am a backer of Dino Blue in, in the Dawn Run he didn't say a negative about her but I am inferring that she has had a little bit of a problem since her run in Clonmel because he made the comment that she did her first bit of work um, since Clonmel the other morning and he, she said that she did work very well. I would find that surprising that she hadn't worked since the middle of January now. Um, she had no entries. She had an, ent an early entry in the Dublin Racing Festival was taken out the five day stage. Now I'm happy that she's worked well but I, I hope that whatever setback that she has potentially had uh, has been minor. And the other interesting one was the comment around um, Fasil Vega, the champion bumper, fa champion bumper favourite. He, he talked about how he'd worked well last year, done, done a really impressive piece of work but he also said that he got jarred up after it. Um, 
and I, I think I mentioned on the show post Dublin Racing Festival I thought he, he is quite a marked knee action I am still a little bit concerned about him going on potentially faster ground at Cheltenham and coming down the hill at speed I think that is the possible hole in him there, there's no hole in his form although that said Sander Clegane the horse that was running up to him did get beaten yesterday a little bit of a steadily run race at Nace probably not the suit so yeah I, I thought those few negatives just something worth bearing in mind aside from all the obvious positivity about horses going well and so on yeah, brilliant. Some good takeaways there. Uh, Barry, did anything prick your ears reading the stable tour? Yeah, no, and I'd echo Tony's uh, thoughts, especially Alban Fodder and Fasal Vega, so there's definitely two question marks Just there. Just on but that, Barry, and um, Fasal Vega and the fast, faster ground at Cheltenham, um, just honing in on that you know the pace of the race in the bumper and coming down the hill and obviously a track like that, do, do you really think that that's not going to suit him with that knee action? No, he's the fact he's been jarred before. Will he let himself down? Um, I I I took him board. Tony said at Leopardstown about his his action. I wouldn't refer to it so much as knee action, but he has high action. He does hit the ground hard, but he's not to me. He isn't a, a mudlark. He doesn't need it really soft. Um, so I think it's just it's a case of will he let himself down coming down the hill if it is on the quick side. And by Wednesday evening, it won't have had as much water as it would have had on Tuesday morning. So it could be gone a little bit quick from so it's definitely a question mark you'd have to take it on board um, and as you say album photo likewise a negative about him who's a horse who had a slight negative last year as well and they felt maybe just slightly underperformed but those are the two negatives the positives may appreciate it really happy with his work taking him away to do a piece of work you know the benefit for him of not going to the race course and not running them albeit the, the experience he would have loved to have picked up with a, with a run over hurdles especially a recent run um but it's a controlled environment his work is in. So he's not going to have a hard race that might set him back and his recovery mightn't be as quick and as good as he might like. So it's very much controlled. He can do as much as he needs to do and judge the work that he needs to give him. So he's very happy with him. That's a real positive. The other one which was really interesting was Shaq and Pursois to say that he hasn't asked Paul yet which horse he's going to ride. And for him, it's Shaq and Pursois each day. So that's really interesting. Um, and Orgamin has tried to beat Shishkin and couldn't beat him. Have they got a way of beating Shishkin with um, Shaq and Pursois? If you draw a line through his runs in uh, England in the past, obviously the hamstring issue the last time in the Tingle Creek, but he underperformed previously in the champion chase and he's keeping him fresh. He's leaving him a gallop short. He mentioned that on his last run at the Dublin Racing Festival. So there's a few interesting things there, but the Shaq and Pursois especially, um, because there just could be another little edge to him. Very interesting. Plenty of takeaways, positives, negatives, and things that maybe were a bit of a surprise too. So plenty to take away from the stable tour. Let's kick on with what happened where. Obviously a slightly quieter week on the racing front on both sides of the Irish Sea, uh, but some horses that we want to pick up on, and one of them would be Farouk Dalen and Beacon Edge in the Tenet Novices Chase. Uh, both of them ran belters, Farouk Dalen winning, but Beacon Edge running extremely well. Farouk Dalen is now 16s for the Brown Advisory, and Beacon Edge is about 20 to 1 shot. Uh, Tony, what were your takeaways from this race? You know, the Brown Advisory is much more open than it that would have looked maybe um, a week ago with um, Gallop and the Champs potentially going for the short trip. I, I haven't been a fan of Beacon Edge as an novice chaser, but I, I've changed my mind after watching him last Tuesday. I thought this was an excellent run out of him um, where a lot of things were against him. He was effectively having his first run since the Drinmore. Which, which was a big ask and he'd had colic in between times same story last year um, and he built a lot on his first run after the colic um, last year so I, I'd be expecting a lot of improvement in him for that run um, and the market certainly spoke very strongly in favour of the the Farouk Delen, the owner mate um, he was also given £7 to Farouk Delen. I'd say Farouk Delen was much better suited by the slower ground at Navin I'd say his Cheltenham bid would be very ground dependent um, and as well as that it, it was by far the best uh, jumping performance out of Beacon Edge all season he's not the biggest and that would be a concern at Cheltenham but he's a kind of a 16 20 to 1 chance um, for the 3 mile race if his jumping held up and it would be an if that I'd probably be willing to take a chance on at that sort of price um, very classy hurdler with Cheltenham form in a race that is, is a bit more winnable now, I, I think he's a big runner. I know Noel Mead at Cheltenham wouldn't have the greatest record, but plenty of place runners over the years. At that sort of price, I, I would be very interested in him for that race. 
Okay, positive mention for Beacon Edge and Barry Farouk Delen. I feel like with him, his jump, he can he can put in a fair few mistakes around these staying chases. His jumping tends to let him down a fraction. It does, but you'd have to be impressed with Beacon Edge's jumping. And I think the the cheap pieces that he had fitted previously, which probably assisted in his fall in Leperson because they just might have got him being a bit too aggressive. But he learned from that. And he jumped really well. Farouk Delen, his jumping can be hit and miss at times, but I think the seven pounds that he got off Beacon Edge made a big difference and you'd have to take Beacon Edge as being the horse to take out of the race but to go three mile so close to Cheltenham in a tough race like that on heavy ground would have to leave a big question mark over both horses for me Um, I won the RSA a good few years ago on a Foylands boy who um won the Reynolds Town which would have been a week earlier and he never travelled a yard in the RSA but just got going late to win and I put that down to the proximity of that race. So for me, I'd be just a little bit concerned about the timing of that run so close to the festival. Yeah, just on that, I, I, I did a little bit of research just on that. I, I won't bore everyone with the stats, but just in terms of horses days since last run coming into Cheltenham, most horses, and this has come from 2010 up to the most recent festival, most horses will have run in the 31 to 60 days um, bracket. Most Cheltenham winners. Probably the best time seems to be the 60 to 90 day off period. They kind of are the most profitable with the best strike rate. The ones that have run within the month do okay, but there'll be a lot, of, a lot of runners. I suppose a lot of those maybe will be handicappers and stuff like that. And anything that's coming off a break of more than three months really is struggling. So I'm, interested, I'm very interested to hear Barry's thoughts on that because I feel I'm getting sucked in with a couple of horses here that have run the last couple of weeks that I like them. Chihupu last week and Beacon Edge, I'm going to mention another one now. It is a little bit of a worry that the, the soft ground and proximity to the meeting. But yeah, the other the other horse that I liked um, that ran the last week is, is for the Mayor's Hurdle. Um, I, I thought Queensbrook ran a really promising trial behind Boring Victory um, at Pontchestown. Now, Boring Victory, first of all, the time was very good. I think they would have got to 10 seconds quicker than Ramilly's the same course and distance made in Hurdle winner later on the card, which is a good start. Um, Born in Victory was wearing the first time cheek piece that Willie Mullins has been using on a few of his horses lately to sharpen up their jumping and she did jump better. The only thing I would say is that the punch of town was configured really tight um, last Wednesday. Like they were doing two laps to get up to two and a half miles and getting on the lead there was a massive, massive advantage I'd say. Um, she's going to face an entirely different setup in the Mayor's Hordle, different track, uh, much bigger field. Um, Stormy Ireland's going to be in the field, having help us, you know, front runners. So she's not going to get much pace. I could see her jump and maybe falling apart a little bit. But Queensbrook, I'd say the track configuration was no good to her. Um, she was giving weight to the winner. Looking back at some of her form going back, um, she ran a screamer in the champion bumper, I think, in 2020. Like, she was toured to um, Fernie Hollow, who, who probably be odds on for the article, and I appreciate it, who's whatever, 72 for the champion hurdle. Good horses in behind there, third time lucky, people slag him off, whatever, he's a 145 horse. Esky Lane, kind of a similar horse, Ocean Wind, 110 flat horse. She looked like a steer that day. I thought last season was a bit of a mess for her. She had a couple of runs over two miles early on, won the first one in Fairy House race that actually worked out alright. Then she got beaten by Skyus up north, still a grade one winner. I mean, she finally went up to two and a half. Um, she seemed to get injured and didn't run after that. She's come back this season of a long break. I presume needs the run, needed the run first time at Wexford behind Lunar Display. Gordon Elliott says that she is quite stuffy. Comes on a lot then to beat Sheldon Edge, who's was won his next three after that, admittedly over fences, but beat him well. Now, he said she's had a setback in between that run and Punchestown last week, and he was iffy on getting her ready. He was going to have to give her race course gaps. It was a massive positive that she could, he could run into her at Punchestown last week. Um, she made a sticky jump two out, which, which wasn't a lead, but she closed all the way to the line. I'd say the different setup in Cheltenham is going to suit her. A stiffer track, more pace to run at, um, just a more truly run race. She's eight or nine to one for the Mayor's order. You know, sometimes you think, are the prices kind of accurate at this time? I, I think that could shorten a bit. Um, I think the Mayor's order. It's a kind of a race where there's probably about six to eight to ten mares that are in the 140, 145 range. I've already backed Heaven Help Us. I was a bit disappointed with her run at the Dublin Racing Festival. I'm hoping Cheltenham's going to spark her as it has done in the past. But I think if there's if there's a mare or two that can get up to 150, can find the improvement. I think this Queensbrook has that kind of profile. She has the scope to do it, especially up in Trip. Now, things starting to go right. I think it was a Creo best the last day. I think that's going to be good enough to win it. Now, there could be three or four of them in the lane jumping the last. She'll stay well. So, yeah, I, I like her. Um, I, I, th I think she's a, a very fair price now, 8 or 9 to 1 at the minute for the Mayor's Hurdle. 
Excellent case made for Queen's Brook. I was so surprised when I was looking back at her form. She went off 6-1 to one for that champion bumper. Short enough price, but that somehow surprised me. Uh, Tony, let's stick with you. Iker Allen boosted the Vorban form and is in the mix for the Boodles and the Triumph. Any interest in him going forwards, looking at the festival itself? No, not, not particularly. Uh, I, th I thought he things go his way on Saturday. Um, I'd like to see seen... Um Fahi's horse stand up now two out. I think he might have given him a little bit of a race. Um, look, I, I think he had things. He jumped poorly at the Dublin Racing Festival. I thought Mark Walsh had actually manoeuvred him into a very good position, leaving the back, and he just wasn't good enough. But it is a boost to Vauban's form and to the Tord horse, um, Aletia Thompson. Uh, look, the, the, the more, most interesting race at Ferry House on Saturday was this potential Grand National trial. Um, any second now, Chin and Ascari at 10. Any second now, such a likeable horse. Um, and again, he's been prepared very well for this Grand National. Uh, I thought he jumped stickily for, for most of the race. It wasn't the greatest surprise because the first run of offences since the Grand National last year, where he basically did everything go wrong for him. He made significant trouble on a couple of occasions. Um, but he's toughed it out really well. Not at a scary at 10 on the line um, and goes to entry with, with a right chance. On a scary at 10, um, I'm going to come back, to, he's going on to the entry, the, the entries. I'm going to come back to my belief, I, I don't think he's going to stay in marathon trips. Um, I think he's looked really good from three out to two out to the, to the last um, on Saturday. He's just quickened up and, and you know, gone away from the, from the field, travelling very, very smoothly, and he's just been out steadily. I think he's a pure three-miler. Uh, people would point maybe National Hunt Chase last year. He, he was a good toward, whatever he was. But I was just looking at some of the sectional times from the National Hunt um, Chase last year. Like, there were actually the guts of a second quicker from four out than the, than the Arca last year. You know, over basically twice as long of a trip, so that was a very steadily run race. So I would just have concerns about him at a marathon trip, but I think back at three miles, there's definitely a good race to be to be won with him. And um, he did basically everything right, bar his stamina, just gave way a little bit late on Saturday. And Barry, I think you do not agree with Tony on this when it comes to Ascari ten staying capabilities. Yeah, well, he did look that like that in the national chase last season. Um. But he has, he's a year older now and a year stronger. I thought it was a really good race. They pulled 42 lengths clear of Borough Saint, who was favourite. Um, I just thought a scary at 10, because he was getting the weight off any second now, they used that advantage. They kicked off from around the turn in, down to two out, and they got first run on any second now. I thought Mark Walsh was brilliant on any second now, just a timeless challenge and come with run, run. And he only just done him on the line. So I don't think a scary at 10 lost much in defeat. Um, to judge him on that race to say he wouldn't stay I'd have to disagree but definitely in the National Hunt chase he didn't get home as well as you would like but I'd like to think with a year under his belt um, that he's probably more able and entry is a different track because it's such a flat track if you can get a horse relaxed and sit quiet from four out three out into the straight you can hang on to a bit more if you're travelling well enough you don't get sucked into a battle so for me I'd still have him in the picture for a, for a Grand National and any positive nod towards the winner himself? Any second now? Oh, definitely. I thought it was a great performance. Both horses, as I said, 42 lengths clear of Borough Saint. Um, and they had um, uh, Coco Beach back another 19 lengths or so further back. Um, and he was only 19 lengths behind Longhouse Poet in Goran in the Tiesta. So it was a good race. And it's had two very, very much smart big performers for the, for the Grand National. Okay, positive ticks there from Barry anyway. Uh, Barry, let's stick with you. Uh, just an, the, another day, another Supreme Horse for Willie Mullins was unleashed. This one, bring on the night. Obviously, I, not an ideal starting point, but it looks as though he might go to the Supreme. What did you make of his performance? It was a good performance. He, he quickened well from two out and uh, ran around going to two out, which you'd forgive him being green on his first run over hurdles. Uh, he'd missed the first hurdle, but jumped okay to the middle part of the race and was untidy at the last. So the lack of experience is his biggest issue, but he did quicken well from two out. He quickened again well from the last. He beat a smart enough performer too um, in second place, but experience is his issue. Um, he definitely has ability whether he's good enough for the Supreme this year I can't say but his jumping and the lack of jumping experience I think is, is what might trouble him You and Constitution Hill aren't losing any sleep about him then? No and I wouldn't think uh, Kilcross or Dysart Dynamo or Jan Bonner or, or any of the others so there's, there's, there's too much strength and depth there to, to really think that maybe this one I can get in there in one run he'll need to improve an awful lot for it 
Okay, um, before we leave Ireland, Tony, just a bit of a nod towards Henry de Bromhead because the signs now that his stable is finally, looks like, might be coming back in some sort of form just in time. Yeah, a little bit uh, double at Nice uh, on Sunday, a good winner at Navan Brampton Bell the previous week. Uh, just think there's some worth maybe pointing out just how his season has gone. I think to be fair to, to him, um, he's done very well with his with his best horses all season. Uh, Honeysuckle obviously has one or two starts. Plutard went to England, won a big race, was only just beaten um, at Christmas. Bob Allen was unbeaten. Tell me something, girl looks to be brought to the boil very well. Um, for the, the Mayor's Hurdle, even Captain Guinness, he's placed him well to win a couple of races. And again, even Manel Indo has come back to form and stuff like that. I do think it's a kind of a, a tale of two halves of the yard, though. Um, I'm interested to see where his next star is going to come from. There was a very in interesting interview with Jamie Codd um, in the race and post about a month back, talking about Gordon Elliott and how Gordon Elliott is obsessed with stock. And obsessed with where the next winner is coming from. I don't mean the following week. I think he meant kind of two or three years down the line, and always tend to buy the next winner and stuff like that. Now I assume that Henry de Brom had has gotten a kick out of last year in terms of um, getting younger horses in and stuff like that. Um, but it, it definitely hasn't come through yet. I would say fairly strongly. Um, so like incipient stars need to start off somewhere, and in Ireland that's one or two places. Um, bumpers are, are made in hurdles. Now. And, and stars really are starting off more in, in, in the winter time now Henry de Brom had won a fair share of maiden hurdles and, and, and that during the summer months but just looking from October I, I think this is quite interesting so going from October bumper and maiden hurdle winners um, Willie Mullins is 33 Gordon Elliott 29 and Henry de Brom had just 11 if there's no big three be that numbers it's, it's the big two so like who are, his, who are his two kind of up and coming young stars at the minute um, Journey with me yeah I, I can buy into that I'm not his greatest fan but he's unbeaten and all that who's next Chantrose and, and plenty of them aren't progressing like Largy Debu went, went back with um, a couple of horses I've been on recently the short go and Music Guitar didn't really come forward so yeah I, I just think that's an that's a probably dilemma that they're facing with yes the, the established horses and, and you would expect them to go to Cheltenham and run the races but the, the novices the really unexposed ones uh, the cupboard doesn't seem um, just as full as it is with the established horses very interesting, Tony. That is why you're paid the big bucks, you see. Um, Barry, let's move over to the UK. And just a quick mention of Knight Salute. Obviously, one his fifth hurdle race on the bounce has been a bit of a standout star for Milton Harris this season. Now heads to the Triumph. But would you in do you think that he can give the Irish horses a run for his money? I don't think so, no. I think Paddy Brennan's been brilliant on the horses. I think Milton Harris has play, placed him brilliantly too. Uh, he's done really well to win his five, but no, I, I'd, I'd rather, for an English challenger, I'd rather be in Porticello um, on the new course. I think he's a better stayer. Um, Knight Salute beat him in Doncaster, obviously a flatter track, um, and I think Knight Salute just had an edge on pace. Um, if Porticello can jump the way he jumped in ahead of Glaston, I'd see him finishing in front of Knight Salute, and I'd imagine there might be a few Irish in front of that as well. Okay, negative shout for Knight's Loot is currently about a 14 to 1 shot for what looks like a very competitive and classy triumph hurdle this time around. It's competition time! We're giving away some off the fence merchandise. Head over to attheraces.com to be in with a chance of winning an off the fence beanie cap and an off the fence mug. Uh, let's move on to viewers' questions. This time, this week on Twitter, we asked a few of you to send, well, we asked you all to send in your questions and you got in contact with us. And as we would expect at this time of year, they were all pointed towards Cheltenham. Tony's going to hate this section, but he's just got to bear with us for a second. So without further ado, uh, Jason Barber has asked, what are your naps for the meeting? What an original question, Jason. Thank you very much. Uh, Barry, we'll go to you first for this one. Uh, what's your nap? Aloha. I'll have be the one. I'd have to agree with Willie Mullins. And, uh, and Tony? Yeah, uh, boringly, Alaho as, as well. This quite, the answer to this question changes every week because the price changes. I thought my best bet at corn prices is, is Queensbrook. Love that. Okay, okay, fair. Um, and on a similar line, Steve Lathian? Lathian has asked, which short price favourite is the most likely to be turned over? Tony, you go first. Um, again... That was actually a hard question. Um, I have a three here I don't particularly like. Um, Brandy Love is into favourite after 
rumours of Allegari Davasi possibly having issues had the mayor's or uh, mayor, the dawn run sorry I don't particularly like Hoff reasons covered before um, he's not favourite but, he, but he's near it um, Blue Lord I don't like him for the Oracle I think he might have been the third best horse in that first time um, and I haven't really got into the handicaps yet but I see that Buddy Rich is favourite for the Grand Annual um, I don't think he's genuine uh, I, th I think he's a lot of short priced in running defeats and things like that and lost races that he should have won so uh, Gordon Elliott though uh, festival handicaps obviously outstanding record but uh, I, he might have better ones than that OK there's three for you that are a no for you Steve uh, Barry I presume you'll disagree with the Blue Lord negative there um, I, I don't know what to win the arc I think it's too tricky um, very open race one good jump one bad jump uh, Blue Lord wasn't didn't jump as well as he can do at Leopardson so I would just slightly forgive him on that but I would agree with Tony and Brandy Love um, going back there on the back of two runs jump badly left in Ferrius and I know I'd felt after Ferrius that that wasn't um, as big an inconvenience as people thought but it wouldn't be I wouldn't forgive it enough to make it favourite so I'd be against Brandy Love and uh, Fasal Vega, for the reasons we mentioned earlier about being jarred up, con slight concern about the ground, and plus the bumper. You just don't know what's there. Anything can spring up. So to have a short price favourite in the bumper, I think a lot of the short price ones are strong, but you know what the opposition are if they run to their form. Whereas in the bumper, you just never know what Springer is in there. So um, I'd be slightly against Fasal Vega. Do you, just side note question, Barry, from your bloodstock breeding sort of side of things, do you have any interest in the champion bumper this time around? Anything you've had anything to do with? Um, no, I haven't, no. Um, but plenty of nice horse there. American Mike, they're raving about him, um, and especially as a horse for the future. So whether he's good enough to win the bumper, but um, I get the impression he's a horse who could be a, a smart novice hurdler next year. Whereas Fasal Vega, it's all about this year. Interesting. So it's a negative for Fasal Vega and two negatives for Brandy Love. Uh, Jax Delad, great name. Jax Delad. Uh, Barry, we'll come to you first for this one. Good question, this I thought. What is another course that a horse might have form with to predetermine that they may go well at Cheltenham if they haven't run there before? Tricky enough one because there's, there's, mm. Cheltenham is unique. It's such a tight track that turns, but the hill is the thing that finds out so many as well. So for me, Ascot and Navin would be the tracks each side of the sea and you've racing at that level you know you've high class racing in both Ascot and Navin so for me if you can win a novice herd and novice chase in either of those places you've the right side of horse for Cheltenham. Tony what's your view on this question would you have gone with Ascot and Navin as well? Barry would be much better place to answer that question to me um, I think statistically Leopardstown has always been the best trial track of the Irish tracks for, for Cheltenham just in terms of horses that had their last run at Leopardstown so I'd go with that. Okay, um, and we'll stick with you, Tony, for this last one. Paul Lancet has asked, uh, give me a horse for a handicap hurdle and a horse for a handicap chase. I'm sorry, Paul, I, I just have nothing on this. Um, I have barely looked at the entries. Like I, I just get totally overwhelmed when I see these entries come out. Um, weights might make it a little bit easier, 80, 90, even 60 horses in a handicap. I'm just thinking I could do a whole Irish card in the time it will take me to look at one of these properly and I still wouldn't fancy my chances of finding the winner. So no, I'm definitely waiting five days um, and 48 hour decks for the handicap. It's just too tough. Fair enough. Don't forget, Paul Lancet, you know, Tony has a full-time job, puts in all this effort for the show as well. So we'll give him that free pass, I think. Uh, Barry, did you select anything for this question? A handicap hurdler or, or and slash or a handicap chaser? Yeah, well, as Tony says, the handicaps, you just don't know what's going to happen with the weights. And especially then you have the, you know, you have the issue between the English and Irish handicapper and what's the English handicapper we're going to give the Irish. But two horses I do like would be uh, Good Time Johnny. I thought he did really well uh, to beat um, the horse of M. Mullins last time in Leopardstown, right place, right time, who was well fancied and well backed on the day. So he's a seven-year-old on an upward curve, Tony Martin. He knows how to get one ready for Cheltenham and his horses are in good form. So I thought he'd be one. If the English handicapper doesn't go to town on him, one would a definite tweak. Uh, and I thought frontal assault maybe for the Kim Yor. He's had three runs over fences, finished off well behind uh, floor in Fairy House last time, jumped nicely um, and has good uh, form over a trip as a novice hurdler. So he could be a, a one with a squeak in the Kim Yor maybe. 
Okay, fair enough. Uh, thank you very much everyone for your questions as always and they were all pointed towards Cheltenham but don't forget that the weights come out on Tuesday this coming week and then on top of that we will actually be doing our full Cheltenham Festival preview this time next week and so bear with us with that. Uh, we'll have lots of your questions answered, lots of tips coming your way ahead of the big week itself. Uh, before we move on to a quick look at the Gold Cup and the Stayers and to, um, Having said all of that about our Cheltenham Festival preview next week, we are just going to have a look at the anti-post markets for the Gold Cup and the Stairs Hurdle in a minute. But before we get there, uh, a little mini offence section, a part two, shall we say, on what we found offence with last week. Obviously, the Paul Kimmage article in the Irish Independent. Uh, Tony, you voiced your thoughts last week and you have a few follow up notes, I suppose, this week. Yeah, nothing particularly uh, offence um, merited really. Um, I think I made most of the points last week. I don't have an awful lot new. Look, it wasn't what I expected. Um, I, I was expecting, uh, I suppose, a bit more dramatic on the on the dope and stuff, but that's not what we got. I, I thought it was a convoluted, even confusing piece, not the easiest read. Uh, I do wonder if... Its location in the physical paper was kind of as an, as an inset. It was the middle pages. I wonder was there some late um, editing going on there with, with legal stuff around the IHRB and things like that, um, the, getting a response from them, but they don't seem to be communicating with the Sunday Independent at all, they're doing their, their uh, media stuff through other outlets and, and things like that, so yeah, maybe for, a bit forgiving on that. Look, there was really was little about the doping, um, it was a lot of, not a lot of though, there were two references to kind of historical allegations and things like that. Um, there was mention, I thought this was well phrased, like about stuff in the breeding industry, about skinny two-year-olds coming out as bollocks as three and four-year-olds that were slow developers. But that's only a phrase, like horses do turn inside out from season to season, we see that on the track and stuff like that. Um, I think the gist of the piece was to, to represent the IHRB officials uh, as being incompetent or not totally professional in the way they're carrying on their business. Um, maybe. Maybe. Um, I'm unconvinced. I'm, I'm not a strong yes or no on that either way. Um, Lynn Hillier, who in general comes across as, as very um, assured and confident when, when you see her doing media work and interviews like that, was seen as, uh, I suppose, a bit uncomfortable, a bit unsure in her questions and answers at the at man's um, hearing. Uh, around dates and times and stuff like that. The sense I got from her is that she was trying to get a case, uh, a welfare case across the line and was pushing a witness that was having a bad time mentally. Um, not ideal, but these cases are difficult to deal with and she got the bit between her teeth and, and probably wanted to do that. So I don't know. Uh, I don't really have an awful lot more to, to add beyond that. Um, not what I expected. I'm not sure how it progresses from here. Is there more to come? Um, but yeah, as far as I'm concerned, I'm just kind of back to wait and see mode uh, with this. Uh, not the bombshells that I, I was anticipating. No, I would concur those thoughts. I think confusion reigns at this point, but you can't help but feel that this is a saga that is going to rumble on and on, unfortunately. Let's hope that it doesn't sort of cast a bit of a cloud over the Cheltenham Festival. That'd be one thing I'd be a touch worried about with the timing of this article and just two weeks away from where we could have uh, real Irish domination, I suppose, at Cheltenham and is that going to raise more questions? Anyway, um, let's move on to more positive chat. Now we've got that out of the way, we're going to have a very quick look at the Gold Cup and the Stairs Hurdle. Uh, let's start with the Gold Cup, boys. And Barry, we'll start with you. The market, it's going to, it might not be the classiest Gold Cup of all time, but it's going to be a very competitive renewal. When you look at the prices in the antipost market now and the horses lining up, loads you can make a case for. A blue tart up at the top there, Galvin next best, Manella Indo, uh, Irish domination for sure. But what's your view on the race at this point right now? Yeah, I think it's a very open, competitive race. Um, obviously, Henry's horse has shown a resemblance of coming back to form. is a big thing. A Plutard, Manalendo, um, both with good runs at Leopardstown last time in defeat. But um, they both needed to be better than that. And there is potential for them to be better than that. So, you know, you have to respect them on those runs. Um Galvin, likewise, his run in Leopardstown, I believe his work has been really good since as well. So signals are good with him. Um, album photo, he's the negative. 
but Willie commented on during the week so you'd have to you know you'd have to think twice about him protect the rat though I think is a very fair contender for the UK um, great run and entry has good Cheltenham course form so I think he's definitely one with a squeak Tornado Flair for me he was 37 lengths behind that Plutard in last year's Savills Chase um, that would have represented us. He didn't get the trip by the felt, albeit he got it in the King George. I'm not so certain he'd get it on a stiffer track, but Willie seems convinced that he will. Um, Chantry House, Nicky holds faith in um, and thinks he is better than he showed in the Cotswolds chase. So, but there could be a little bit of value at a fancy price each way, but you're taking it on, on Nicky's word. But it's competitive. Um, at this stage, it's hard to say we'll win it, but it's uh, it's good to see Henry's come back to form for Aplutard and Manilindo. And Manilindo, on his best, he could be the one. Yeah, and actually, if we're talking about takeaways from stable tours, obviously, Nicky Henson had his press day as well, and that was probably one of the big takeaways from over here on that day, just his sort of fondness and keenness and faith, I suppose, in Chantry House for the Gold Cup. I think a lot of people have jumped from that ship, but uh, he's he's... Yeah, really keeping the faith with him. Uh, as for protector art for the Dan, Dan Skelton team, Tony, he falls into the category of it's been over 100 days since his last run, just referring back to those stats of yours. Would you have any interest with him, uh, one of the horses at a bigger price in here? Um, he's a horse I, I don't really know how to weigh up. I, I was reading Dan Skelton's interview. He also had, had an open date. He, he has just decided that he's going there fresh with these horses. Um and he, he was saying that his past chat and winners have come on horse and fresh. I, I don't think that would be the reason that, that he gets beaten. And I think leaving a, a gold cup horse, um, as Barry has mentioned, kind of without a prep run tight to it, um, probably makes sense. Um, but yeah, he, he'd be a horse I would find quite difficult to weigh up. I've actually never been as lukewarm on a gold cup as this year. I usually would have a, a fairly strong opinion on it. I just don't this year. Um, that may well change between now and now in the meeting. Look, the the front two are quite solid. Um, I would prefer Galvin just a little bit over a Plutard. Um, because he's a first timer in the Gold Cup. I'm a sucker for a horse having its first run in the Gold Cup. I think it is such a a, a rare occurrence that they, they they manage to get beaten in it and, and come back and win it. Then uh, horses, I suppose, maybe can win it and come back. But I just think it's such a tough ask. Um, and I, I do like this thing about Galvin. Um working well because I just got the sense before Christmas they just didn't think he was good enough but if his work is kind of sparked and he's coming forward we know he likes Cheltenham um, I thought he was a bit better than the bear farmer at Christmas though I can see the case for a blue tart as well I'd probably lean towards him of the others I have no feel for Manel Indo I've kind of been getting him wrong all year so I'm just going to kind of leave him alone I'll boom photo the age would be a worry the, the negative reports would be a worry um, Tornado Flyer wouldn't be a massive surprise if he got involved. He's still a second season chaser. Uh, sorry, towards season chaser, but, but unexposed to the trip, should I say. But it's whether you trust the farm at the last day and, and the race would very much run to suit him. But yeah, Galvin would be my lean, but it wouldn't be a strong view. Okay, not a strong view there on what is a wide open Gold Cup. And then we could say the same about the Stayers Hurdle. Uh, wide open, loads of question marks about so many horses in here, but yet so much talent as well. Uh, you've got Flooring Porter up at the top of the market, Classical Dream, Champ, Time Hill, Paisley Park. I mean, all of them have had their days in the sun, yet all of them can throw in an absolute stinker for various reasons, whether it be in their body or their mind. Uh, Tony, it's a race, it's a division we've spoken plenty about on the show throughout the season where is your head at at the moment with this sort of lunatics anonymous race is what i'm calling it don't think anyone punters really need to be in a rush to get involved here just yet 26 runners left in it at the minute um presume a lot of those will run it's open it tends to be a big field just historically last four years you've had 15 15 18 and 15 runners like you're definitely getting four places on the day there you're possibly getting five um, I'd probably be inclined to go for a little bit of a result. Um, I do worry about Florent Porter's attitudes um, and the crowds are uh, an unknown with him because um, his big success have come in, in quiet race courses. I don't like Classical Dreams prep as mentioned before. Champ is getting on in years. i uh, just a bit disappointed with his um, run there in late January. I think Time Hill has potential. I, I do like this fresh angle with him that... He's coming here off whatever two and a half, three cuts, three months break. That might bring improvement, but there isn't any great juice in the price. Um, so I may be inclined to go for a result. I would be interested in Royal Kahala if she ran here. I think she improved with the step up and trip in the Galmai. Um, that form has been boosted by Ashdale Bob, who was a well beaten toward there 
going closer than having last week. Um, it's a worry. The track is a little bit of worry. She, she didn't perform here last year, but I'm actually not as concerned about the ground as I was earlier in the season. Looking back, draw form. She actually ran really well at Punchestown on the Morgiana. Hordle day on the ground was quite quick. So she actually might be more adaptable, especially up in trip. She might be able to get away with it um, a little bit. I do less again. I do like a horse kind of getting the mare's allowance. A really good mare. Um, again, she may not be running ground dependent and all that, but I, I think she would have a chance. Okay, bit of a squeaker for a horse at a double figure price. Royal Kahala for Tony and um, Barry. Are we are we keeping the faith with Champ at this point? You could, but I don't know. Um... You know, he's, he hasn't backed up. He didn't back up his first run last season when he was second the game spirit. He went to the Gold Cup. So he didn't back up his run then this season either. So, you know, can you just back him blind on what he did the last day? Because Paisley Park beat him, but I don't think Paisley Park had to beat an awful lot on the day. Um, listening to Garasco was in third as well, whose form has been pretty poor too. So although I've been mentioning Paisley Park, I always felt Paisley Park was overpriced. But as this race got hotter and hotter, I was thinking he's going to struggle to make the frame, and I still think he will. Um, if unless some of the the fancy ones underperform, which they're highly likely to do, and Champ is one of those on his best day, on his Ascot run, I think he could win this. But who knows if that's going to happen? And um, Florian Porter won the race last year as a six year old. I thought that was a brilliant performance for a six year old coming back here as a seven year old. He's the right kind of age for the race. But Tony makes a very good point about the crowd. There was no one there last year, so that could be an issue for him this year. The start as well, and then you have Classical Dream going to take him on at the start, or what happens, and you have 25 runners or whatever. You have, you have an army of runners, so it's just not going to be straightforward. Classical Dream, uh, will he put his hands up? and said he gave him a big break and he needed a run that day in Gorn. That was the whisper in Gorn that day is what happened. So it hasn't just been something that's been thrown out later. Um, that was the feeling on the day. So he possibly is the one who hasn't blotted his copybook as much as the others. Um, Florian Porter say, has a strong level of form last year, but he could be his own worst enemy. So I'd be inclined to go with Classical Dream. Time Hill was well held by Champ in the long walk hurdle and I think he needs to be better than that I'm sure he would improve for the run but I think he needs to be better than that um, so for me I'd be inclined to just maybe go with Classical Dream and hopefully Willie can just work the article with him like he did with Alaho after he had that tough race in the John Durkin first time in the season OK, a few lukewarmish nods there for you. I promise we'll have some stronger opinions on the show next week <laughs> for the uh, when we do our Cheltenham Festival preview. Maybe not in this division or the Gold Cup division because the boys have covered that quite well. But uh, stay tuned for plenty of tips coming your way. And that about rounds off proceedings. But before we go, usual thing, uh, we finish the show with a bit of tracker time. Barry, who is your tracker horse, please? You know, I thought Gardner ran a cracker. He was third in Navin behind Madman's game uh, in the bumper. He ran out in his only pre his only start in punch than last season. Now, I'd hope he's going to get back a bit sooner because he didn't run from May until February. So hopefully we get him out sooner than that this time. But he had a good run. Um, his jockey seemed keen to keep him in cover because he ran out in the past. He got a little bit outpaced between the two and the one, but he ran on well up the hill in Navin. So I thought it was a good performance. It was a good bumper and uh, one to keep an eye on. Tony, who's the horse that you've picked out for us from the last seven days? I thought Anne Scarry uh, shaped quite well at Fairy House last Saturday um, under um, a ride that wouldn't have suited how the race went. It was very steadily run. Um, first for home were up at the pace throughout. He over raced a bit in rear um, and seemed to be travelling quite well coming into the strip, but just could never get a run. A mistake at the last kind of compounded things. Um, had some good form going back as a bumper horse, particularly behind it, let's be clear about it. And would have ran a very good race at Galway last year when second to um, MC Muldoon giving him weight. So I think there's probably a handicap in him off his mark. Okay, Ennis Carey for Tony. Uh, that wraps up the show for another week. Thank you very much, Barry. Thank you very much, Tony. And thank you very much for watching, as always, or listening, now that we're on the podcast platform as well. And just a further nod towards next week, because that will be our official Cheltenham Festival preview show. But until then, thank you very much for watching. That was Off The Fence. <laughs>